Dear organizers, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, present to you the Swiss uh, civil law codification. Dear colleagues, I'm uh, absolutely happy to be in Budapest. Last year I was, last time I was here, first and last time I was in Budapest was 25 years ago, so I'm most happy to be back, I would say, and uh, to enjoy your beautiful city. And uh, congratulations for this uh, fantastic uh, organization in this beautiful building, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I was about to start with the affirmation that the codification of private law in Switzerland took place relatively late uh, compared to other Western European countries, but we have heard from Professor Weckers that uh, Swiss law codification uh, is part of the first generation of civil codes. So, but, so let me correct, uh, we were the last of the first generation to have um, um, civil law codification. One must remember that Switzerland uh, did not become a proper state until uh, 1848. Uh, until then, it had been a confederation of states, which is still reflected in the international two-letter abbreviation CH for Confederation Helvetica. So it became a state proper in 1848, uh, but still did not have a federal constitution. This only occurred in 1874. And this constitution of 1874 did not confer to the federal, to the confederation, the competence to legislate in terms of private law, but it gave it the competence to um, enact a civil uh, a law of obligations. We have heard this from Professor Reiner already. So um, this reminds me a bit of the development in the European Union. Um, it's absolutely crucial to be able to have an inter in, an inter market with, an, uh, with the same currency, with the same rules concerning um, trade and commercial matters. So this is what, come, what came first and we have uh, our first code of obligations in 18 and 81. So the second uh, civil, no, so, sorry, the second um, federal constitution of 1898 conferred to the confederation the competence to legislate in the field of private law in the large sense. And, um, but first, uh, actual preliminary work had been done by one important person, the name has already been uh, mentioned today, Eugen Huber. Um, Eugen Huber, I will say certain things about him in a second, um, but before that, Eugen, actually no, I will say it now. Um, Eugen Huber had studied extensively the cantonal um, civil codes that existed until that time, and he published, before um, drafting the civil code, he had published a, a fundamental work um, which was called The System and History of uh, Swiss mm -hmm. Private Law. Um, until the entry into force of the Swiss Civil Code, uh, there were um, um, cantonal codes. There were even cantons who had no code, but those who had one uh, could be um, subdivided into three groups. There was actually the group uh, whose codification uh, uh, had been inspired by the Austrian Allgemeines Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch. Um, this was Bern, uh, among others. And then we had codifications modeled on the French Civil Code of 1804. This was uh, the western part of Switzerland, the French-speaking part. And then then we had the codification of the canton of Zurich, uh, which was drafted by Johann Kaspar Blunschli, who had studied with Karl Friedrich von Savigny, the name was mentioned, founder of the conception of a historical approach and the study of positive law. So it was actually the founder of the historical school. Blanchely was influenced by Savigny's ideas, but he tried to overcome the opposition between historical school of law and positivism in this Zurich um, uh, codification of private law. So um, when the code, the, the federal uh, civil code entered into force in 1907, um, it was highly praised. Um, one German scholar, Josef Kohler, spoke of the greatest and most significant deed to be recorded in jurisprudence in recent years. And Franz Wiecker, also known to 
all of us uh, said that it's the most mature fruit of the 19th century German language jurisprudence in the form of law. It sometimes was opposed to the German BGB, which was considered as being um, very uh, theoretical and on a very high level of abstractness, but we have another um, lecture who will uh, deal with that. So um, I think that there are three characteristics um, that are worthy to be mentioned. First of all, the ZGB, as we say, the, the Zivilgesetzbuch, the, the, the Swiss Civil Code, is uh, what we would say true to life or close to people. Some people have even said it's folkloristic. Um, but one must say that Eugen Huber, so the drafter, the mastermind of this civil code, was a journalist and editor-in-chief of the NZZ, the Neue Türcher Zeitung, which is our most um, most uh, serious uh, newspaper for since centuries, and so may maybe that this has um, had an effect on how how he wanted the wording to be in this civil code. Actually, he was convinced, Eugen Huber was convinced that the law uh, should be. Um, uh, that anyone who reads the code should have the impression that the law is spoken from his heart. Um, it should be accessible, understandable, also for non-lawyers. There is this little anecdote saying that Swiss uh, people at the time, not nowadays, but Swiss people at the time, had two books on their um, night shelf, which was the Bible and the Swiss Civil Code. So I think this has changed by now. Um, so he also said never more than three paragraphs and no more than one sentence for each paragraph, no long sentences, no cross-references. Um, examples, um, there is one article dealing with capacity. It's just very simple, what everyone understands. It's anyone has legal capacity. Or there is an article which has been abandoned by now which said, uh, Heirat macht mündig, which you understand, it's marriage makes one of age. Minors could uh, marry at the time and were then released from the paternal uh, power. Um, the flip side of the coin is that the uh, civil code is less precise, is less systematically consistent. For example, sometimes it speaks of the right to withdraw from the contract, and what is meant is that you have the right to cancel the contract for the future. Or uh, it speaks of an action for termination or an action for reduction of the price in sales law, but it's not a judicial instrument. Actually, you can uh, exercise the right to reduction without going to court. Um, so that was the first uh, element, I think, the first characteristic which, uh, which, which can be said about the Swiss Civil Code. Second characteristic, uh, the emphasis on the power of the judge. Um, we have this famous Article 1, Para 2 in the Civil Code, which says that if no rule can be derived from the law, the court shall decide according to customary law or where such is also lacking, according to the rule that it would establish as a legislator. Um, so this shows the, uh, the light motif, I would say, of the Swiss legislation, Swiss legal culture. It's the broad scope for judicial discretion. We have numerous general clauses. I think this is something that we took over from the French Civil Code. We have uh, Article 2, Para 2 of the Swiss, uh, Swiss Civil Code uh, speaking about good faith and the prohibition of abuse of rights. We have a very simple rule for the protection of personality rights, which is very beneficial these days, uh, seeing all those developments that are happening uh, um, in, uh, in the digital age. We say any person whose personality has been unlawfully infringed may bring an action before a court. So simple, so broad, so unclear at the same time, but obviously it, it allows for, for um, covering um, the, I would say the, 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 new, the new problems that are coming about, um, which um, for us, for the time being, we don't need any legislation, at least that's the uh, general opinion, we don't need any legislation in terms of digitalization or 
um, protection of privacy because it's already said and then it's obviously up to the court to fill this with life. Another example is Article 43 of the Code of Obligations, uh, which says that the nature and extent of the compensation for the damage incurred shall be determined by the judge who shall assess both the circumstances and the extent of the fault. It shows to you that um, the, there's a broad leeway for the court. I mean, it's always the circumstances of the case at hand, and it's, a, it's an enormous trust, actually, in the judicial power. Um, it's the courage to leave gaps, which has um, often, often been said, and it characterizes uh, the Swiss legal system as one that has great confidence in the judiciary, especially, as you might know, since it elects the judges itself by direct popular vote. This holds true for first and second instances courts. Um, third characteristic is its monistic system. This has already been mentioned as well. Uh, we don't have a commercial code and a civil code. We don't have a co um, the con a consumer code. Everything has been put into one um, codification. Um, we have also all, all legislation concerned with the protection of the weaker party included in our civil code, at least traditionally, I have to say, because as of late, there have been numerous special laws dealing with uh, separate um, or with, with specific questions, this uh, um, especially holds true with regard to EU legislation. Obviously, Switzerland is not a part of the EU, but we do what we call an autonomous implementation of uh, EU law, where we think that it fits. Um, it fits. Okay. Um, so, I would say that um, it's, uh, it's, it belongs to the German legal systems, but it has been influenced by French law. Um, it has had some radiance, one has to say. Uh, Turkey, for example, took over the complete uh, civil code and law of obligations. This is why uh, Switzerland and Turkey have a very close um, uh, well, a very close connection. Um, the Turkish very much look into Swiss law. They, they translate Swiss uh, books, textbooks into Turkish. Um, the contrary is less uh, frequent, but it happens from time to time. Um, you might know that the, uh, at the time when Turkey uh, became a modern state, um, the Ministry of Justice was studying law in Fribourg, which is my university, and he studied it in French, and he liked the Swiss Civil Code and the Law of Obligations, and he just decided to take it over, tel quel, so as it was, and this was then transposed into Turkish law. Um, it has also had some influence, I mean, not just just in parts um, in, in Italian legislation and the third and fourth generation, as we heard this morning. Um, the principles of European contract law, uh, authored by Ole Lando and Hugh Beale, um, have mentioned the style, not the content especially, but the style of Swiss legislation. And Ole Lando was uh, quoted once saying that um, it, the, the principles of European contract law read as if some authors abided by the maxim of, of Eugen Huber to keep things simple. So what will the future bring? We tried to um, modify our uh, codifications or the law of obligations. This was an, 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 a major project. Uh, it was called the Code of Obligations 2020. It was abandoned. The Ministry of Justice considered that it's not yet the time to modify the code. Um, there are New challenges, I've mentioned digitalization, there is also, there are others, um, where is an amazing uh, legislative activity in the European Union and elsewhere, and there is nothing going on in Switzerland. Maybe it's because it's, it's lacunary, but at the same time can be filled with uh, what it needs um, these days. So I would conclude my remarks by saying that my, what, what, what my distinguished uh, colleagues said this morning, um, codification provides for a coherent, systematic, 
approach which, especially if it is flexible enough, uh, allows for adaptation to social and technological developments without necessarily um, asking for amendments or modification of the law. Thank you for your attention.